Oh, good day, everybody. This is Chris at The Ancient Scholar. I hope this video finds you all doing well. So in today's video, what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about a commonly utilized antidysrhythmic in the pre-hospital emergency setting, and that is uh, an antidysrhythmic by the name of amiodarone, also uh, goes by the trade name cordarone, at least here in the United States. This is an antidysrhythmic that's been around for quite some time, but it is a very complex antidysrhythmic, and it has complex dosing guidelines and I think it can be a daunting task to learn about this, particularly when you are first coming into contact uh, with this particular agent. So hopefully I can make it a little easier in this video. We'll see how things go. So first of all, amiodarone is a drug medication that's been around for a long time. It is FDA approved to treat life-threatening ventricular dysrhythmias. Think of ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. Okay, those, those kinds of uh, situations. However, due to its complex nature and its ability to interact with uh, multiple receptors and have a multitude of effects on the heart, uh, you actually have a lot of off-label uses for amiodarone, particularly in the treatment and management of uh, certain types of supraventricular tachycardias or SVTs, oftentimes when atrial fibrillation is involved. So you may actually see amiodarone used outside of the approved context uh, off-label, often in the setting of treating supraventricular uh, dysrhythmias, again, um, often in the setting of atrial fibrillation. All right. So that's kind of what amiodarone is big picture. Uh, amiodarone, again, has been around for quite some time. It is uh, from a chemical structural perspective. It's actually structurally very similar to, um, to thyroxin, which is uh, one of the active thyroid hormones. Um, and it does contain um, iodine like thyroxin. And so uh, there are some uh, thyroid toxicities that can result uh, with amiodarone, particularly in the chronic use of amiodarone. In addition to that, amiodarone has some other special toxicities associated with prolonged use. Um, it does increase the risk for pulmonary uh, fibrosis. And because it is a class three antidysrhythmic agent that does um, work by blocking uh, potassium rectifying um, channels and potassium rectifying currents, it does prolong the QT interval by widening uh, the QRS complex. And so it does, uh, interestingly enough, increase the risk for a certain type of life-threatening dysrhythmia known as torsade de pointe, which is a type of um, which is a, a type of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So QT interval prolongation is a side effect of amiodarone and uh, with uh, corrected QTC prolongation would generally be seen as a contraindication to administering amiodarone. So those are some of the uh, special toxicities we see associated with amiodarone, but amiodarone Again, it's a pretty complex drug and it has a multitude of uh, side effects in addition to the major ones that I've uh, just talked about. We talk about the pharmacokinetics of amiodarone. I'm gonna focus more on it as a parenteral uh, medication. So given um, intravenously or interosseously as, as opposed to uh, orally, the uh, absorption and distribution is a little different uh, between parenteral and enteral. So we'll focus on parenteral and of course the absorption is essentially uh, is essentially going to be 100% uh, when you're giving it a parenterally. Uh, as far as distribution goes, uh, amiodarone is fairly, it's actually highly lipophilic. So it's a very large volume or parent volume of distribution. Um, and it will tend to accumulate in adipose tissue uh, and skeletal muscle as well. Um, and this is a part of why it has such a long uh, duration of action and a long elimination half-life we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Uh, the metabolism or biotransformation of amiodarone, uh, it uh, undergoes extensive hepatic metabolism, that should come as no surprise, and the uh, CYP450 uh, microsomal enzyme system plays an important role. Uh, specifically, the C, uh, C, CYP2C8 and CYP, uh, I believe, 3A4, and in the process of metabolizing, there is an active metabolite of amiodarone that is produced. 
All right. As far as elimination, elimination of amiodarone is actually fairly unique. Um, many drugs or their metabolites, active and inactive metabolites, tend to be eliminated through the urine. This is not the case with amiodarone. Amiodarone is primarily eliminated through the gastrointestinal tract uh, through a bile, all right? Uh, less than uh, less than a percent of uh, amiodarone is actually uh, excreted in an unchanged form. So it it, it requires uh, a high degree of biotransformation metabolism, and it is eliminated uh, via the GI tract as opposed to the kidneys. So what does this mean? This this collectively means that amiodarone possesses a fairly long half life of several weeks. And um, it may take up to uh, uh, six, seven weeks or thereabouts for the clinical effects to wane off. And some of the pharmacological effects of amiodarone can persist for several months, one, two, uh, up to three months in some cases. All right, so the pharmacokinetics are very unique when considering amiodarone, all right? So that's just kind of the basic uh, rundown of, of amiodarone. Uh, let's just talk about um, the indications and contraindications for amiodarone. So we talked about the major indications. Uh, so ventricular fibrillation and VTAC, cardiac arrest, where the underlying QT interval is not prolonged or you presume it is not prolonged. So you would not use amiodarone to treat polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or suspected torsade de point if you suspect a prolonged QT interval. Um, so your more run-of-the-mill monomorphic ventricular tachycardia and ventricular uh, fibrillation. Those are your primary indications, but again, uh, amiodarone is sometimes used to treat supraventricular narrow complex uh, tachycardias, SVT, PSVT, and various uh, types of SVT associated with atrial fibrillation and or atrial flutter, AFib with RVR, or AFib flutter with RVR, and occasionally it may be considered uh, when you are thinking about pharmacological options to treat Wolf Parkinson's white SVT that has a, an, an underlying component of atrial fibrillation uh, because we know that AV nodal blocking agents can be harmful in that setting. And even though amiodarone does have some AV nodal blocking properties, it, its primary properties is a class three antidysrhythmic, uh, do make it a little more reasonable to consider treating these specialized cases of Wolf Parkinson's white should you need to do that. All right, uh, as far as major contraindications, obviously uh, if there is a known allergy or uh, severe insensitivity to it, uh, if the patient has uh, some sort of escape rhythm or a high degree AV block, second or third uh, degree AV block, or there's you know, a, a, a slow ventricular escape rhythm, ideoventricular rhythm, or junctional escape rhythm, uh, something on the lines of that. Obviously, if you suspect a prolonged QT interval or you're giving lots of other medications that prolong the QT interval, you would not want to administer amiodarone. And if your patient's in cardiogenic shock, amiodarone would not be a great option. However, amiodarone may be a good option to treat life-threatening ventricular dysrhythmias in patients that have a history of congestive heart failure with a compromised ejection fraction, the hef, HEFREF, um, that uh, amiodarone may actually be a good agent, but in the setting of acute cardiogenic shock, amiodarone would generally not be uh, recommended. Uh, so some of the major side effects of amiodarone that we see, it can cause some vasodilation, so it can be associated with some hypotension. It tends to decrease the heart rate and it can precipitate or it can precipitate or exacerbate uh, underlying um, AV blocks. It can cause hepatotoxicity. It can cause pulmonary toxicity, and it can um, also cause thyroid tox uh, toxicity as well. It does prolong the QT interval, um, and it does have a very uh, prolonged uh, elimination and um, elimination half-life, and uh, the clinical effects may last for months. Uh, so you have to take all that into uh, consideration. Okay, so that's what amiodarone is in a nutshell. Let's talk about how we administer amiodarone. So amiodarone, the general administration of amiodarone in the emergency setting really comes down to what are you trying to treat? 
if you are treating a patient that is in a pulseless arrest, uh, so pulseless VTAC and ventricular fibrillation, you will treat one way. And then if you are trying to treat a patient that has a pulse, right, VTAC with a pulse, or maybe you're trying to use it to treat some sort of supraventricular tachycardia, we tend to dose it a little differently. So let's talk about cardiac arrest as that's a little easier to think about. So in cardiac arrest, you're going to administer 300 milligrams of amiodarone IV push in the adult patient. Pediatric dosing is uh, weight-based and uh, I'm not gonna focus on that in this particular video. So here I have some amiodarone. This is uh, three milligrams per 150 milliliters. So you can draw up 300 milligrams of amiodarone and then you can give it rapid IV push. Uh, you can give repeat doses of amiodarone every three to five minutes. Uh, not to exceed about 2.2 grams in a 24-hour period. So that is amiodarone in the setting of a uh, life-threatening ventricular dysrhythmia that is causing cardiac arrest, i.e. VTAC or VFib. Let's talk about using it to treat um, generally more stable, wide complex tachycardias and or uh, supraventricular tachycardias if you have the ability to do that. Uh, in that case, the dosing does become a bit more complex. So the initial loading dose is going to be 150 milligrams, right? So you're going to take 150 milligrams. And uh, what I would generally do is mix this in a 100 milliliter bag of uh, D5W if you have the ability to get to use D5W. It is generally recommended that we mix amiodarone in D5W. I believe that's what the manufacturer also recommends. And they also recommend that you give it through a filtered IV infusion set. So that is the absolute best case scenario. And that is what is recommended. So that's what I will say here, even though I understand that dosing uh, or a mixing administration guidelines may vary a little bit from service to service. So you're gonna mix 150 milligrams and 100 milliliters and then uh, you're gonna run this at about 10 milliliters per minute. So essentially what you're gonna do is you're, you're gonna administer this like you would administer promethazine or Phenergan. You mix your dose in a 100 milliliter bag. Um, you pop on uh, a 60 drop tubing, uh, so micro drop tubing. You run that as a piggyback into your main line, typically just wide open, and it'll take about 10 minutes to infuse, right? So that is the loading dose, also referred to as a rapid infusion. Now, once you have loaded that patient, then you need to follow up with a continuous infusion. And the continuous infusion is going to vary depending on where you're at in the course of treatment, okay? If you have just finished administering the loading dose, 150 milligrams, the rapid infusion, it is recommended that you start with your first maintenance infusion. This is sometimes referred to as the slow infusion. So your rapid infusion first, and then your slow infusion. And what the recommendation is, is to take 900 milligrams of amiodarone, 900 milligrams, and mix this in a 500 milliliter bag of D5W. So 900 milligrams of amiodarone mixed in a 500 milliliter bag of D5W. You're gonna spike that, label it, spike it with a micro drop tubing. And then what you're gonna do is you are gonna run that at 33 milliliters per hour, all right? Or 33 drops per minute. You're using micro drop tubing. And you are going to do that for six hours, all right? That will give that patient a total dose of 360 milligrams over six hours and a 33 drops per minute is going to give you a dose of one milligram per minute. So you're gonna load the patient with 150 milligrams over 10 minutes and then you're gonna administer one milligram per minute for six hours. Now, once the patient has received the 360 milligrams over the six hours, okay, you're gonna to need to switch to the third and final infusion, and this is referred to as the maintenance infusion. So rapid infusion, 150 milligrams IV over 10 minutes. Uh, the slow infusion, one milligram per minute for six hours, and then the maintenance infusion, 
and you're going to administer 0.5 milligrams for 18 hours, or you're going to administer, well, and or, it's the same thing, 17 drops per minute. So you're going to do the same thing as you did with the slow infusion. You're going to take uh, 900 milligrams of amiodarone, mix it into a 500 milliliter bag, label it, spike it with micro drop tubing, and then you are going to administer that at, you're going to run that at 17 drops per minute, so half of what you were running when you did your uh, slow infusion. And that is going to give you a dose of 0 0.5 milligrams per minute, and you're going to run that for 18 hours. So you're going to load with 150 milligrams over, so one of these in a 100 milliliter bag over 10 minutes, 150 milligrams over 10 minutes. And then you're gonna mix 900 milligrams and 500 milliliters and you're gonna administer that uh, at, at, zero point, or at one milligram per minute or 33 drops a minute uh, for six hours. And then you're gonna mix another infusion and you're gonna run that at 0 0.5 milligrams per minute or 17 drops per minute over the following 18 hours. And that gets you a full 24 hour period. And at that point, hopefully the patient is stable enough and they're in an inpatient setting where they can be transitioned to oral therapy. And we will not be talking about oral um, or enteral uh, amiodarone therapy because that kind of goes beyond the scope of the uh, video that I want to talk about. So I think that is a good introduction to amiodarone and the indications, contraindications, some of the things to look out for. And and, and of, of great importance to us, how the hell do we administer? How the hell is it administered? So I hope you all found this uh, video helpful and uh, we'll just see you in the next one. Take care, everyone.